start of the tour was on a dark November night from London Airport. A large crowd had gathered at Heath Road to join the royal family in wishing Godspeed to the Queen and the Duke. The Stratocruiser Canopus stands ready on the tarmac to take off on the first stage of the royal journey. Soon, the final farewells will have been exchanged. From one of the windows of Canopus, the Queen waves. aircraft begins to move, the royal tour has begun. It having been decided that Cinemascope was to make this vivid contribution to the story of the royal tour, our camera unit took ship by the eastward route via Suez and captured these glowing pictures of the canal en route. of SS Malaya now, steaming down the Red Sea towards Aden, the British colony at the southern tip of Arabia. Here, as always, the bumboat men were very much in evidence. again into the Indian Ocean. At Colombo, capital and port of Ceylon, ships of many nations ride at anchor. Aboard SS Malaya, Cinemascope came to the South Pacific. It was at Suva, capital of Fiji, that Cinemascope joined the route of the Royal Tour. Gothic, having sailed westward via the West Indies and Panama, lay at anchor in Suva Harbor, surrounded by dozens of the picturesque craft which skim the waters of the 320 islands of this archipelago. Now a launch puts out from Gothic and Her Majesty sets foot on Fiji, our first glimpse of her in the southern hemisphere. The islanders' welcome followed their own tradition. Its first quaint embodiment was the three-year-old daughter of a chief who, in presenting the bouquet, performed her part with perfect ritual. Step back, sit down, clap hands. That's the correct form in Fiji. It's another local custom to show respect by preserving silence. Cheering is not the outward sign of loyalty among the 300,000 Fijians. As the ornately dressed chiefs make obeisance to their queen, silent solemnity is the watchword. The token of obeisance is the offering of a whale's tooth.
but now the silence of the occasion is broken as with guttural accompaniment a rare beverage called Yang Gona is prepared. When the brew is ready, it's offered to Her Majesty in a coconut shell. The Duke follows suit, honoring an old and revered Fijian custom. After the dance of the warriors, and how formidable it must have appeared to their enemies in days gone by, the Queen and the Duke were conducted on a tour of local schools. From the war dance to modern standards of education. No doubt the Queen and the Duke marvelled at the progress which less than a century of benevolent administration has wrought in Fiji. Smaller than Fiji, Tonga is a land of friendliness and godliness, for Tonga was an early stronghold of the mission. It is also the only kingdom in the Pacific, and its royal palace has all the atmosphere of a delightful country house. Tonga's tall Queen Salote, beloved of the British public, conducted her royal visitors to the scene of a great feast. Tropical fruits, roast sucking pig, chickens, crawfish and other delicacies are laid out in a vast and appetizing array. More than enough for a thousand guests. And for those guests it's convention for them to help themselves. Here a Tongan version of the war dance was performed. You'll notice that women take part in the dance, its warlike origins having been tempered by the influence of the church. In fact, the dances of Tonga owe as much to the rhythm of nursery rhymes as they do to the pagan chants of Polynesia. Nowadays, Christianity is cherished in Tonga with a devotion which has itself become a tradition. The Queen and the Duke worshipped in the Wesleyan Church with a crowded congregation of Queen Salote's people. As they left with their smiling hostess and bade farewell to the minister, it was nearly the end of their brief stay in the land which Captain Cook in 1770 had named the Friendly Isles. Later, on the landing stage, wearing garlands of flowers, they said goodbye to the hospitable queen of this small community and to her son and prime minister, Prince Tungi. Then, with the warm sound of Tongan voices ringing in their ears, voices of Polynesian people singing an English hymn, they boarded their launch to go back to their ship and the tour of New Zealand, which lay ahead of them.
Gothic had two days sailing between the Friendly Isles and the Northern Island of New Zealand, 1,200 miles away, the city and port of Auckland was preparing to give the Queen and the Duke their first experience of the Dominion's enthusiasm and loyalty. Auckland, the largest and most cosmopolitan city in New Zealand, possesses a splendid natural hub. But alas, on December the 23rd, when Gothic approached, rain and mist shrouded its entrance and veiled the majestic scene. Rain marked, though it failed to mar, the reception of the royal visitors by the city's people. In fact, in its fervor, the crowd outside the town hall broke ranks when the Queen took her place on the decks. With Mr. Holland, the Prime Minister, beside her, Her Majesty then replied to the address of welcome. Mr. Mayor, I thank you most sincerely for the address of welcome which you have presented to me on behalf of yourself and the councillors and citizens of Auckland in association with the local authorities and residents living near your city. This is the first time that I have spoken to New Zealanders in their own homeland and my first words must be to tell you how happy I am to be amongst you. Christmas in New Zealand is very different from its time-honoured setting in the Northern Hemisphere, but the Yuletide season in Auckland is nonetheless festive. Along the harbour beaches with Rangitoko Island in the background, holiday makers bathed in the sunshine and engaged in their water sports. Afterwards, they ate Christmas dinner, picnic fashion, on the foreshore. At Government House, where the Queen and the Duke were staying, and a special celebration was staged with carol singing, a Santa Claus, and gifts for Prince Charles and Princess Anne. Then the royal visitors attended Christmas service at St. Mary's Cathedral, walking in the procession behind the bishop and clergy. Passing on from Auckland, the royal party entered Māori country. One of their first calls was on King Koroki, a Māori chief who'd had a mild grievance against the New Zealand government. This tactful courtesy helped to heal a source of friction. It also gave the Queen and the Duke glimpses of a picturesque procession of Māori war canoes. and so to Rotorua. Here at Arawa Park, the biggest Māori reception of the tour took place. The Māori people yield to none in the fervour of their attachment to the throne. the welcoming haka, the Queen delighted the Māoris by accepting and wearing a korowai, or ceremonial cloak of chieftainship. Attired in this, she delivered her speech, and to the further delight of the great gathering, ended with the famous Māori greeting. Mr. Minister, representatives and chiefs, 
of the Maori tribes of New Zealand. I am most grateful to you for the address which you have presented to me on behalf of the Maori people. My husband and I have been much inspired by the welcome we have been given here today. And we have been delighted and interested to see your age-old ceremonial and dances. I thank you again for your welcome. Kia ora kutu. To haunting and lovely tunes, Maori women now perform their poi dances. performance, a small stranger seated herself at the Queen's feet and stayed there while the show went on. And what a show it was. Weirdly painted faces and curious grimaces are all part of these complimentary displays by the valiant Maori race. A race once diminishing in numbers, but happily now on the increase again. took their departure amid scenes of tremendous enthusiasm as the Maori people thronged around. They stayed in the district of Rotorua for some days. This magnificent thermal region is one of New Zealand's beauty spots. Famous hot springs shoot up from below the Earth's surface to provide an exuberant spectacle. Pohutu, the most impressive of them all, is sometimes temperamental, but she produced a glorious display for this important occasion. Almost as strange, though not so beautiful, are the mud pools with the eerie sound made by their bubbles as they burst. But the scenic wonders of the Rotorua district were not yet exhausted. The Queen and the Duke paid a visit to Paradise Valley where great rainbow trout swim in the placid waters of a reserve. New Zealand's trout are famous. Its unpolluted streams provide some of the best fishing in the world. New Zealand, Wellington, is situated, like Auckland, in the North Island. Its whole population of 135,000 seems to have been present somewhere along the route to see the Queen and the Duke enter their city. One of the first actions of the Royal Travellers was to pay a visit to the Citizens' War Memorial. important official engagement was of course to open New Zealand's parliament. The occasion was quite unique 
Never before had the sovereign of New Zealand come in person to inaugurate a session of the country's legislature. The Queen wore her coronation gown, that wonderful creation of regal dignity and the dressmaker's art. And as she turned to acknowledge the ovation before entering the building, her youthful radiance was really breathtaking. Another official occasion was the garden party at Government House. When the Queen came out with the Duke to join the guests, thousands were assembled to greet them on the lawns of the Governor-General's residence. Many had the honour of presentation, and indeed the atmosphere of a garden party at the Queen's own Buckingham Palace was very faithfully reproduced in Wellington. Some lovely country surrounds the capital, and a drive through the Rimutaka mountain range was the prelude to arrival at Trentham for the race meeting. Everything here, with one exception, was reminiscent all the ingredients of Epsom or Newmarket were there, except the British bookmaker. The horses parade for the big race. I can tell you in confidence that the winner is going to be a horse called Golden Tan. After the finish, there was quite a crush to get into the paddock, known locally as the bird cage. But the timetable for the tour was rigid. The Queen and the Duke had to abide by its rules and leave Wellington and the North Island. To reach the South Island, they took a Royal New Zealand Air Force Dakota. climbing swiftly, winged its way over the Cook Straits, which divide the two chief islands of the Dominion. The South Island contains the Southern Alps, a range whose magnificence captures the admiration of all visitors. It stretches the whole length of the island and has been the training ground for such great mountaineers as Sir Edmund Hillary, one of the conquerors of Everest. this range passes the railway from the western seaboard to Christchurch in the east. It runs through Canterbury province, the source of Canterbury lamb. The homes of Britain have good reason to know that New Zealand breeds fine sheep.
royal train carried the Queen and the Duke through scenery of great grandeur to Christchurch. This, the largest city in the South Island, cherishes its English atmosphere. Sentiments of loyalty are profound here, and another great ovation awaited the royal travellers as they drove through the streets. Trotting is one of the specialities of the Canterbury district, and the Queen and the Duke attended the trotting races at Addington, not far from Christchurch. Race procedure follows the same pattern as orthodox racing. The entry is now parade for the Royal Metropolitan Cup. Just watch those horses speeding by with all that peculiar smooth and lively rhythm of the trotting. <laughs> From Christchurch, the journey was again by train with intermittent halts as here at Amaru. resumed their journey, the royal travellers stood on the observation platform acknowledging the cheers till they were drawn out of sight. The royal train travelled down the eastern seaboard, past river and woodland, as far as Dunedin. Everyone should know that Dunedin is the old name for Edinburgh. It is, in fact, the Edinburgh of New Zealand. And here, when the Queen and the Duke arrived, Scotland was very much in Edinburgh. When they presently attended the Highland Games at Carisbrook, it was just like Braemar or Danube. and the lasses were as bonny as an old Scotland itself. Yes, it was Scotland all the way for the last few days, and what more fitting climax to their wonderful tour of New Zealand. Gothic steamed westward across the Tasman Sea. Ahead lay Australia. Sydney, that great port and city, its famous bridge spanning the harbour, lay basking in the heat of a glorious summer morning, eager to greet the first reigning sovereign ever to set foot on Australian soil. This great metropolis of the southern hemisphere has grown to a population of one and three quarter millions in a century and a half. The harbour is large enough to contain the entire fleets of Britain and the United States. Gothic arrived from New Zealand after three days sailing. The Royal Barge, having left the liner, proceeded through a lane of over 500 yachts and launches. to greet Her Majesty were the Governor-General and the Prime Minister of Australia and the Governor and Premier of New South Wales. The Queen and the 
Duke stepped ashore at the very spot where Captain Philip landed in 1788 to become the first governor of New South Wales. The Queen replied to the city's address in these words. Standing at last on Australian soil, on this spot that is the birthplace of the nation, I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. For Her Majesty's first impressions of Australia, Sydney had exerted itself with characteristic vitality to put on a tremendous show. The triumphal arches which spanned the chief streets of the city were certainly magnificent, but no more impressive than the framework of Sydney's enduring asset, the Harbour Bridge. Opened in 1932, the 1,650-foot span rises 440 feet above the water. Rich in the many natural beauties which it has to offer, Australia also possesses a series of really fine beaches. Queen had no doubt been made aware of the fame of Bondi, where a surf carnival was to be held in her honour. It was a blazing hot day, and in the glare, the Queen was finally compelled to use her dark glasses. Then the surf racing. Boats, manned by crews from the different beaches, pulled out through the breakers. At a given point, they turned to come coasting in again. It was obviously a great thrill for the Queen and the Duke, who overstayed their appointed time at the carnival by 30 minutes. Then, somewhat reluctantly, the royal party left. The Blue Mountains provided spectacle of a different kind, glorious in its tranquility. The Queen and the Duke came to Katoomba, not far from Sydney, to survey the superb panorama from Echo Point. Those pinnacles are the famous Three Sisters, 
a landmark which has lent itself to the weaving of legendary stories. Canberra is situated in the Australian territory of southern New South Wales. In 1911, the federal government decided to build the capital of the new dominion here, midway between Sydney and Melbourne. Noble buildings have arisen on the virgin ground of Canberra, but they are merely the nucleus of the great city yet to come. As luck would have it, the weather turned unkind for the opening of the federal parliament, rain caused some alteration in the arrangements, and Her Majesty, robed once more in her coronation dress, had to pass directly into the parliament building. Later, however, it was possible for the display by children to be given, and their formation of the Australian flag on the opposite hillside was followed by a march past of the Australian services. And so the journey continued. Melbourne, the capital of Victoria, with 1,400,000 inhabitants, was reached after a sea journey to Tasmania. Melbourne's Shrine of Remembrance commemorates the men and women of the state of Victoria who have given their lives in the wars of this century. today to pay homage to the men and women of Victoria who gave their lives in the Second World War and to commemorate the magnificent services rendered by all those who went forth from their homes to fight for us. To the glory of God and in grateful memory of the men and women of this state who served in the Second World War, I dedicate this forecourt and set alight the flame in honor of all those who died for us. Let us ever be mindful that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now the queen kindled a perpetual flame. with the governor of Victoria, General Sir Dallas Brooks, she descended the steps to cross the new forecourt. Open-cut coal mines at Yaloan are among Victoria's most remarkable industrial enterprises. Those water sprays are to minimize the risk of fire. This vast and valuable deposit is estimated to contain 6,000 million tons of brown coal. Perching precariously, as it seemed, on the very edge of the coalface, the great dredger excited more than ordinary curiosity. Melbourne, too, had prepared a remarkable display of street decorations, and at night, the city burst into a riot of colour. The welcome of the children was expressed literally in a huge display on Melbourne cricket ground. 17,000 youngsters took part in this gathering.
after this, the senior girls showed how well they could drill. performed a maypole dance with ribbons of most attractive pastel shades. of increasing industrialization, which the local discovery of uranium is likely to intensify, Adelaide preserves a lovely and gracious appearance with fountains in its parks and the famous Australian black swan. One feature of the city is that its amenities, such as playing fields and stadiums, are located in the center of the city. The royal party paid a visit to the cricket ground where a game was in progress. Here, presentations of cricketing celebrities took place, among them, none other than Sir Donald Bradman, one of the greatest of them all. The match itself was a local one. A visit was also paid to Huayala, which has sprung into prominence during recent years as yet another industrial center. For the Queen's entertainment, a corroboree had been organized and South Australia's Aborigines entered the arena in full war paint for their performance. As Mr. Menzies, Australia's Prime Minister, has reminded us, Australia is the home of the Queen just as much as Britain. Certainly judging by these pictures, both the Queen and the Duke felt very much at home. More than half the state's population live in the capital, and by an unfortunate turn of events, a polio epidemic had broken out, which caused some modification of the official arrangements. No scare, however, could affect the warmth of the welcome extended next day during the royal progress through the city. Under the revised plans, the Queen and the Duke spent the nights aboard Gothic, but came ashore daily to carry out their program. program 
them included visits to upcountry towns and communities by aeroplane. Air travel, which brought them to landing grounds used by the Royal Australian Air Force, gave them the opportunity to appraise the splendid efficiency of this young service. Most of the 630,000 people of Western Australia are settled in the southwestern corner and they live among very attractive scenery. itself, the program included a civic reception. The Queen and the Duke took their places on the platform with the Lord Mayor, but in accordance with precautions adopted by government order, the Queen's bouquet was not actually accepted by hand. In the afternoon of the same day, in the same location, the Duke addressed a big ex-service parade. Mr. President, at this last great gathering of ex-servicemen and women, the Queen has asked me to say what an inspiration it has been throughout this visit to Australia to see the comradeship which you formed in war carried on into peace. We have seen how you have cared for the widows and children of your friends and how you have helped the disabled. It is this practical humanity which has our admiration and our respect. The Queen and I are most grateful for your address and for the wonderful welcome you have shown us. We wish you all here and indeed every ex-serviceman and women throughout the Commonwealth of Australia a happy, prosperous and peaceful future.
now it really was the last day of these two historic Australian months. Fremantle, the port of Perth, a guard of honour of the Royal Australian Navy was inspecting. Then the Royal Travellers passed along the line of distinguished people drawn up to bid them Godspeed. Mr Menzies, the Australian Prime Minister, can be easily recognised, with him Mrs Menzies. Next to them, the Governor of Western Australia, Sir Charles Gardner and Lady Gardner. Finally, Her Majesty and His Royal Highness, taking leave of the Governor-General of Australia, Field Marshal Sir William Slim and Lady Slim, mount the gangway to the moving sound of Australia's farewell. As Gothic sailed away into the sun, the Queen broadcast her own farewell. Now I say goodbye. God be with you. Until the next time I can visit Australia. Naturally, sailing is the summer sport for the people of Auckland. Their annual regatta has been held for over a century. But the Queen's visit to the Tamaki Yacht Club made this year's event the first royal regatta ever held there. These little Tauranga class boats, seven-footers, are sailed by boys and girls under 16. New Zealand's blessed with perfect coastal sailing waters, so it's not surprising that youngsters often take to sail before they can master a bike. You can't help envying them the warmth and the sunshine, can you? But down at the other end of New Zealand's North Island, the Royal Travellers found it far from inviting. At Wellington, a stiff nor'wester gusting up to 50 miles an hour forced them to make last-minute alterations to their landing programme. The Queen stepped ashore at a more sheltered quay to begin her tour of New Zealand's capital. This is a city built on hillsides. With its houses climbing the gradients above the harbour, it's easy to see why it's been compared to San Francisco. Over 10,000 youngsters were gathered in Athletic Park for a display which pointed the New Zealanders' passion for sport, an almost dedicated approach to physical fitness which has produced world record holders like Murray Holberg and Peter Snell to encourage the up-and-coming winners. At a sheep-shearing contest, the Queen was to see this same spirit of competition 
the aim here being to win the Golden Fleece, the wool on which so much of the Dominion's prosperity depends. A skilled shearer can earn as much as a thousand pounds in a three-month season. Even blindfold, they can remove an entire fleece in a matter of minutes. Remove the blindfold and there's plenty to admire in the end product, a wool fashion parade. Guaranteed to draw your eyes over the wool, some of the gold medal winners. It may look pretty tedious on a sheep, but on a fashion plate, wool seems to have no limit to its versatility. Focal point for the next royal engagement was New Zealand's Parliament building. Her Majesty, in a magnificent gown of white satin embroidered with pearls and diamonds, was to open a special session of Parliament. She was to speak of Europe's movement towards closer association, recently rather a sore point around the Commonwealth, but she expressed her confidence that, together with Britain, our Commonwealth will cope. An impressive formal occasion in a tour which has been unusually informal and memorable for its colour and variety. From Wellington, the Royal Tourists sailed across Cook Strait to start their visit to the South Island. It was near here that Captain Cook claimed New Zealand for Britain in 1770. On the Duke's program, a flight to an outward bound school on Queen Charlotte Sound. Small amphibians like this are a common sight around the lakes and inlets. The Outward Bound Trust was only recently extended to New Zealand, but already it's very popular with youngsters, a reflection of their fondness for the open-air life down under. Sailing and learning how to handle a kayak are just two of a host of activities carried on here. No doubt Prince Philip would have liked to stay longer, but as usual, time was pressing. Back to Britannia for the voyage south to Dunedin, along a coast in places as beautiful as any in the Dominion. No wonder so many people are making emigration inquiries. Certainly, any Scot who may be outward bound will receive a warm welcome in Dunedin, the Edinburgh of the South. Then the flight back to Christchurch across the Southern Alps, which rise to 12,000 feet and more. Wonderful scenery and a foretaste of the colourful pictures to come on the visit to Australia. Queen and Princess Anne leave London Airport at the start of a nine-week tour which takes them to Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Islands of Fiji and Tonga. A big security check was mounted before the takeoff and the Royal Aircraft was searched, but the Queen and Princess Anne were soon on their way to Vancouver where they were to be joined by the Duke of Edinburgh who had been in Mexico. Both the Queen and the Princess wore pillbox hats as matching accessories to their travelling outfits. The Australasian tour will take the Royal Party over 40,000 miles and Movie Turn will be bringing you the highlights. Meanwhile, 
We wish them bon voyage. Yacht Britannia steams into Wellington Harbour, bringing the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh and Princess Anne to New Zealand. The Prince of Wales was to join them that evening after flying in from Australia. After greetings from the Governor-General, Sir Arthur Porritt, and New Zealand Prime Minister Keith Holyoke, Her Majesty inspected a guard of honour. Harbour, the Royal Cavalcade drove slowly through the streets of the capital. Certainly this Royal Tour will go on record as one of the most informal ever undertaken. After the Queen had been greeted by Mrs. Holyoke, she walked with the Mayor of Wellington, Sir Francis Kitts, in an atmosphere almost entirely free from the security measures we've come to expect at home. But the following day, youthful demonstrators were in the crowds as the royal procession passed through the crowded streets for the opening of Parliament at Government House. there were protests from onlookers whose view of the proceedings was being obscured by the demonstrators' placards. Yeah. 
then, as the royal party stood at the top of the steps, the Canberra jets of the Royal New Zealand Air Force flew overhead in salute. 